Have you ever wondered how to grow your faith? How to grow it, how to, how to get it stronger? You know, you can run through the Sunday school answers and, and, and think about which Sunday school answers are more, more often than not correct. Uh, but sometimes we find ourselves asking, how, how can I grow my faith? Well, that's what we're going to look at today in, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're continuing our series, The Power of Faith, How to Have Strength of Faith, Hebrews 11. That's on page 1008, if you're using a Bible, on the pew rack, uh, which you are welcome to take home if you do not have a Bible. Take that one home. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 11. You know, uh, my kids get these little boxes in the mail. My sister has them sent to us. They're these little uh, boxes that are projects you put together out of cardboard and string and uh, a variety of other things. They come with very detailed instructions. They're all engineering projects. They're all educational projects. Some of them are very complicated. Some of them not so complicated, but they're all interesting. One time they made this cannon that shot these balls across the room and uh, 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 Caleb put one together. Yeah, they were waiting at the at the window, and the, the the mail lady brought one yesterday and put it on the front porch. And Caleb had one yesterday that was a uh, a trip wire you can set up, and it, it talks about circuitry. And Liam put one together yesterday that was uh, a trebuchet. You put these little uh, uh, heavy things, you know, in the bottom, and it flings this ball across the room, kind of a deal. Well, Reagan put one together not too long ago. Um, that was an irrigation system. Uh, it came with, I think, some seeds and, and some, some dirt and these little pots, and he, he would fill this little reservoir with water, and I don't, again, I didn't put it together, I didn't read the stuff, and I don't remember anything, uh, I'm not going to say anything, I don't remember uh, the irrigation part of my education. <laughs> but, uh, somehow the water would get sucked out of the little reservoir up into this thing he had, constructed over the plants and it would drip water just consistently regularly into these little pots that the plants were in and so he set this up in front of his window and it would get sunlight and it had the had the good soil and it would get water and the plants would begin to grow and I had this thought remembering this that watching them put their deals together yesterday you know the plant that was in those pots the, the plant wants to grow the plant is designed to grow but the plant needs the right ingredients to grow. You can't just take a seed and throw it on your driveway and expect it to grow. It needs good soil, it needs sunlight, and it needs water. You need all the right elements, you need all the right ingredients, but then once it has it, because it wants to grow, because it was designed to grow, it will grow. The same is true of our faith. Our faith was designed to grow. Our faith wants to grow. But you need the right ingredients for it to grow as it was designed to grow. So let's look at here in, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 13. You know, here in Hebrews 11, the author of Hebrews has been writing about people in Scripture, people in history, who have had phenomenal faith, demonstrated great faith in, in moments when, you know, others would have crumbled and their faith would have uh, uh, fallen by the wayside. But it's taught, he, the author has talked about people like Abraham and Sarah and Enoch and Noah and uh, uh, Abel, these people having great faith. And then he takes, uh, I say he, we don't know who the author of Hebrews was. That was a slip of the tongue. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Um, but the author takes a little break from talking about these people and then he talks about the faith of these people specifically in this, this little paragraph here, starting in verse 13. So look at Hebrews 11, starting in verse 13. Now these all died in the faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So he's, the author says these people died having faith that, that the Lord would deliver on what was promised, even though they had not personally received the promises yet. They believed that God would bring them someday. And, and the author says, so these people that 
everyone he's talked about so far, they consider themselves to be strangers and exiles on this earth. That strangers, that word means foreigner. They, they, this is not their homeland. And that word exiles means a temporary resident. That's why we read uh, last week, uh, Abraham continually lived in tents and didn't set up permanent housing when he got to the land of Canaan because he believed this was not his home, that he had another home waiting for him. That was his anticipation. And so the author says they had faith in what was yet to come. They had faith in what was going to be realized even though they didn't see it where they were at. And Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So this is a consistent theme throughout Scripture, all the way from the beginning, all the way through Paul and 2 Corinthians here to Hebrews chapter 11. We walk by faith and not by sight. And even though these people have not received the promises, they still saw the promises, even though they didn't physically see them. They still, he says, the author says there in verse 13, they greeted the promises. They happily anticipated the promises from afar, from far ahead of time. They were ready for the promises to come. So their faith, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight, their faith was better than their eyesight. Oftentimes we struggle with that, right? Sometimes our eyesight is better than our faith. And we allow what we see and what we experience and the storm and the struggle we're going through to squelch to squash our faith. But we should walk by faith and not by sight and not get distracted by what the enemy will bring to us to keep us from growing in our faith, from being who God designed us to be. I was reminded this morning of a very old movie, 70-year-old movie. Um, it's called The Bridge on the River Kwai. Anybody seen that movie? Great movie. Uh, it's got Alec Guinness in it you know, um, Obi-Wan before he was Obi-Wan, uh, way back when. And, and the, the premise of the movie is, uh, this is, it's a, it takes place during World War II. There's a British battalion or company that gets captured, uh, while they're in Japan and they get taken to a, a prisoner of war camp, a POW camp. And they're taken there and the Alec Guinness plays this commander, uh, Colonel Nicholson. And he's in charge of his group, and they get taken there, and he's a man who, who wants to encourage his men, keep their morale up, even though they're going to this POW camp, and they're going to be tortured, and they're going to be shot, and they're going to be, uh, have these terrible things done to them. He tries to keep up appearances for his men to be strengthened. Well, he is taken, Commander Nicholson. He's taken, and he is tortured in front of everybody. And they see it, and they hear it. And uh, he's still trying to keep up appearances, trying to, trying to keep their morale up. But the guys who are doing the torturing, who, who are doing the breaking, uh, know what they're doing. And they're knowing that this man that all the men are looking to, if they can get him, then they've got everybody. And so what they end up doing is they play to the man's pride. And... There's a, a, a process after having snagged him and snagged his pride. They get him to lead a building project for the POW camp. And they're going to build a bridge. That's why the movie's called Bridge Over the River Kwai. They're going to build a bridge so that their enemies, uh, the ones who are in charge of the POW camp, the Japanese, can have a, a line of supply over the bridge, a train that will go from one area of the country to another and take supplies to their troops. And so the, the men are going to build this bridge. And there's talk among the men of trying to sabotage the bridge and do this stuff. But Commander Nicholson, Colonel Nicholson, uh, convinces his men, no, we need to do quality work. They need to know that we do quality work and we need to put our heart and soul into this. Because in his mind, he's trying to build up the morale of his men, not realizing the whole time the enemy has distracted him from his real goal, from where his real faith should lie, from where his real loyalty should lie. And so they build this bridge, and it is constructed great. And the train, is, it's the very end of the movie, the train is coming across to take supplies to the, the, Colonel Nicholson's enemies, to take supplies to his enemies. And then he realizes there are some men who have come to try to blow the bridge up from the Allies. And he tries to stop them from blowing up the bridge because he built the bridge. And there's this great moment when, when the camera focuses on his face, this moment of realization of what he's done. He has helped the enemy. 
And, and he's, he, he, he realizes, I have done the thing that I was called into the military to stop. And he goes, and I don't want to spoil a 70-year-old movie for you, uh, but the bridge blows up um, as a result of his, his, his efforts at the very end of the movie. And the thing is, we need to have a realization in our own faith sometimes. We need our faith to be far better than our eyesight because the enemy is coming for us to try to get us to take our eyes off of, our, off of the king, off of our king, off of our purpose. And he wants to get us distracted with the ways of this world rather than our homeland that is not here. That's why the author says there, uh, they have not received the things promised because they are greeting them from afar, from yet to come. So we, they consider themselves to, to not be resident, permanent residents of this world. That what was to come is where they really reside. That's heaven. That's eternity. And so he's saying, or the author is saying, up until this point, all these people he's talked about, they had the faith to believe there was more than this. They had faith to believe that there was, that there was something waiting for them beyond, that this, they're experiencing here is only the beginning. And so that's why they had, they had this incredible self-awareness to call themselves strangers and exiles, temporary residents, because they knew this was not it. Their faith was uh, 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 to, to understand that they were here only for a very short time, even though sometimes it seems to take forever and seems intolerable and seems like you're never going to get out from under whatever you're going through. But this is only a short time compared to eternity. I mean, what is 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, 100 years compared with infinity years? It's just a little bitty glimpse, a little bitty breath of what is to come. What is to come is far longer, is far greater than what we experience here and now. Paul says in Romans, I don't even consider it comparable from what we experience now to what is to come. And so these people that he's talking about, these all died in the faith, uh, having faith in what was yet to come. These people, they had to stretch and exercise their faith daily and moment by moment to be constantly reminded that there is more. Have you ever had a, had a situation where you're going through something difficult and you have to constantly remind yourself to stay focused? You have to constantly remind yourself to stay disciplined and not give in to the temptation. Well, that's the idea here is, is exercising your faith, is, is stretching your faith because in reality, faith is a muscle that must be stretched and exercised in order to grow. Faith just like a muscle, must be stretched and exercised in order to grow. Because if a muscle isn't stretched and exercised, it's not going to grow. It's not going to stay the same either. It's going to shrink and atrophy and die. Faith, similarly, must be stretched and exercised, must be put into practice in order for it to grow. And it must be exercised in a variety of ways. I don't know how often you exercise, but if you exercise consistently, you come to the realization that if you do the exact same exercise for a long period of time, some studies show for, let's say, three, let's say four weeks, you do the same exercise for four weeks, your body will become accustomed to it and stop responding to that exercise. They call it a plateau because you've done the same thing for so long and your body's used to it. And so it will just stop developing. It will have reached a point and plateau and not grow anymore. And so you've got to stretch it and do another one. They call it in, in uh, exercise parlance, uh, muscle confusion. Confuse the muscle. Do another kind of exercise. It's the same thing with our faith. You see, we can stretch our faith in a season of great faith, in a season of great faithfulness. And we'll get to a point that we, can, we just begin to do the things that grew our faith now. We're doing those things by muscle memory and by rote and not really thinking in them in depth and not growing our faith because the things that, we, that grew our faith in the past don't grow our faith anymore because we've already done them. It's the same thing as when you grow from a child to an adult. If you're still eating the same things you ate when you were six months old and still moving in the same way you're moving, you moved when you were six months old, 
you're not going to have grown very much. You're not going to have very many nutrients in your body. You're not getting what you need now. Because you need something different now than you did then. You need to eat more now than you did then. Or as Paul says, you need to eat solid food. Paul's writing to a group of people at one point in, in his, uh, I want to say Corinthians, I think the author of Hebrews mentions the same analogy as well, that uh, you need to be off of milk and on solid food. It's time to move beyond what you were on before. I mean, if you've been a Christian for decades and decades and decades, and you're still resting on something that grew your faith when you'd only been a Christian two, three, four, five years, then you haven't grown at all. There's no growth there. If you're still saying, well, I'm not being fed, have you ever met a 40-year-old who's fully capable, who have said, I'm not being fed food? Like, they go to the restaurant and they say, I'm not being fed. Like, I expect the waiter to cut my food up and put it in my mouth. If you've been a Christian for decades and decades and decades and you're not a self-feeder, there's a problem. There's a problem somewhere. There's a, there's a disconnect somewhere. You expect, I mean, when you, when you grow kids in your own house, you, when they are young, yeah, you cut their food up for them and you take care of them, but at some point you expect them to be able to feed themselves. Otherwise, you're going to run yourself into the ground and you're going to be regretting life decisions in about 20, 30 years, maybe far sooner than that. We are expected by God and by Scripture to grow in our faith, to not be who we were. That doesn't mean we need to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Only Jesus is perfect. But we do need to be growing better and better every day. Where you are today, July 31, 2022, you need to be better in your walk with Christ in July 31, 2023. That's the expectation. That doesn't mean Christ's going to leave you if you stumble and, and fall and have difficulties between now and next year. No, he's still going to walk with you. He's still going to pick you up. He's still going to help you grow. But that should be the goal is growth. That should be the hope is growth. I mean, we looked at all those guys we've looked at thus far, and, and late Sarah was in there too, lady. They had, all, they had all kinds of problems. They had all kinds of lacks of faith. And Scripture details a lot of them. I mean, Abraham, I mean, Abraham with Hagar making the decisions he made in that realm and having to wait 25 years to actually see the fulfillment of God's promise in his life. But we get a, a, an example here in Hebrews of a time when he did have faith. Just because you have faith in one season doesn't mean you, that you should never have a lack of faith in another it just means that you're human and you need God to help guide you along in the process. Everybody needs Jesus to help bring them along at some point, at somewhere, to, to lift them up in some area of their lives. But walking in faith should mean our goal is to be better next year than we are this year. That should be our goal. I've mentioned it before, my uncle, his, he, he, he has always said that his, his diet plan isn't to drop 30 pounds in the next 30 days. His diet plan is to drop one pound a year. So in 50 years, he's good. <laughs> he says, that's my plan, one pound a year. Set the goal somewhere to be better next year than you are this year. And so when it comes to our spiritual walk, when it comes to our faith, it should be trying to grow little by little by little and to be where he desires us to be, to grow our faith. It's a muscle, so we got to stretch our faith. we got to exercise our faith. we got to take a leap of faith on a consistent basis. Because what that means is we're trusting the Lord every single day. That when it becomes too easy to do what we're doing, when it's not taking faith to do what we're doing, when you say, take a, a, an evaluation of our lives. If my life is not taking faith, then am I really walking where God wants me to walk? Is my daily time with the Lord, is that really taking faith? Is my giving really taking faith to, to put into practice? Is how I raise my kids, is that really taking me stretching and exercising my faith? Is how I operate in my job, is that really uh, me stretching and exercising my faith? Or if I put it on autopilot and I'm not really putting my faith into practice? Stretching and exercising your faith is key, key 
to walking where the Lord wants you to walk. And you know, a key component of exercising is what you eat. I don't know if you've ever seen those magic diet pill commercials, but they always say at the end, either say it out loud or say it in the fine print, that if you do this and you exercise regularly and eat right, then everything will be good. But the, if you exercise and eat right, then you won't need the thing, but they, they don't say that. But the, the, the eating right has to be there because you can work out five times a week, but if you're not eating right, you're just ingesting junk. Exercising is not going to do any good at all. You got to eat right. What you take in has to be right. It's the same way spiritually. What you take in and, and ingest and process spiritually will have lasting ramifica- ramifications on your spiritual development and faith growth. If you're taking in things as, uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm the sound man today too, so if I lean too far back, we're going to get some feedback. Uh, if you're taking in things with your eyes, with your ears, if, if you're constantly running through certain scenarios in your mind, it's going to be detrimental to your spiritual growth. It's going to do you lasting harm. If what you're binge watching is what, I wrote it here, uh, Proverbs, I read it just the other day, Proverbs 12, 11, calls worthless pursuits, isn't a pursuit of value, it will do you great damage spiritually. And if it does you damage, then it's going to do anybody you have influence on damage to. If it's a worthless pursuit in what you're going after. It's, it's basically empty spiritual calories, and it's going to hurt you in the long run. Look at the next verse, verse 14. The author writes, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland, a homeland. So where they reside is not their home. And he's talking about heaven. Heaven's going to be like going home after being gone for a very long time. It's like a relief. It's like an exhale. It's like a, a peace that comes over you. You just walk in, and you're like, okay, I'm home now. I feel better just just being in the building because I'm home. He says they're seeking a homeland. They're seeking their home. But notice the first part of that verse. The people who speak thus, who speak their faith in this way. That's a unique way to phrase it. The people who speak like this, like their faith is what it is. So their faith is only known because they speak it. We've read so far these people in the first part of Hebrews chapter 11, examples of them living out their faith. But what the author is saying is verse verse 14. It's not just their actions, it's also their voice. It's their actions and their words working in tandem, working together to demonstrate their faith everywhere they go. Because faith has to be both spoken and acted out. It can't be just one or the other. It's got to be both working together because as James says in James 2 17 faith without works is dead you've got to say it and you've got to live it you got to do both that's why Jesus said in the great commission uh, we have to tell the world the gospel we can't just hope they get it by osmosis we're expected to live it we're expected to speak it it has to be spoken out of our mouths. We have to have the words. Otherwise, people aren't going to know what or how to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, come to die and raise for them. We've got to live it out, and we've got to say it. We've got to do both. Not one or the other. Not, uh, uh, what, what's that famous quote that's attributed to Francis Assisi, but it's not. It's really the internet who said it. Uh, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. St. Francis never said that. Um, just like Abraham Lincoln said, um, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Uh, you, three of you got that one. Um, <laughs> uh, you're gonna, I'm going to write that down. Abraham Lincoln, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, he, Francis didn't say that. Francis said you need to speak the gospel, and he did on a regular basis, and it got people who hated him because of it. You need to live out the gospel and you need to speak the gospel. Got to do both. 
That's what we see all throughout the book of Acts, those apostles, those disciples of Jesus. We see them living out the gospel everywhere they went and how they loved and, and how they demonstrated and how they interacted with people. But we see them without fail everywhere they went speaking the gospel. You got to live it and you got to say it everywhere you go. Because that's what faith is. Faith is the, the, the truth that must be spoken in order to grow. Faith that is not spoken doesn't grow. If you don't speak it, it won't grow. You got to speak it. You got to say it out loud in order for it to grow, in order for it basically to multiply. Without speaking it, there is no multiplication. There is no furthering. There is no growth. Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. We learn from that statement Jesus is the one who does the building, but we have to tell people the gospel in order for there to be anything to build. He put that responsibility solely on his followers, solely on his 12 or 11 disciples, 12 once you get to Acts chapter 1, but then they told people about Jesus, those people got saved, and those those people told people about Jesus, and they got saved on through the generations to us today, and so it falls to us, the baton has been handed to us, and it's our turn now to tell people about Jesus. And so we are, you think about it this way, we are in the same line of succession as Peter, James, and John, and you've been given the same baton they were given. As Jesus said in uh, John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, so I send you. I'm sending you in the same way that I've been sent. And so he's given us now that responsibility to tell people the gospel, to speak it. And so if we want our faith to grow, we've got to stretch, we've got to exercise, and we've got to speak it. If we're not doing those things, then it's not going to grow. Look at verses 15 and 16. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, not their homeland, but their other land, the land that they're residing in temporarily, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, he introduces an interesting word there in verse 16. Now, we see that focusing on the things at hand, the world, its current momentary issues, its problems, and its rewards, if we focus on those things, we're going to miss the opportunities of the home to come. But desiring a better home than this world, an eternal home, a heavenly home, that brings the opposite of shame. You see that there he says, God is not ashamed to be called their God because they have faith enough to desire heaven, to act like they desire to heaven, to to act and and speak their faith. So God is not ashamed. He introduces that word ashamed, shame there. So desiring that better home, desiring to live out your faith, desiring a life of faith brings the opposite of shame to the Lord. And what's the opposite of shame? Honor. The Lord is honored by a life of faith. He's honored by by a life of faith. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So if we're ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of us. And we're ashamed of him and how we speak and in how we act. That's what Jesus is saying. But the thing is, you know, shame and honor work both ways, that we have opportunities to honor the Lord by acting in faith, by speaking in faith, by bringing praise to the Lord in how we act and in how we speak. And Paul spoke of this in Romans chapter 1. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for this reason. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God. So the power of the gospel should have a dynamic impact on how we live. It should change us. If we've been changed by the gospel, we should act like it. We should act like we've been changed by the gospel. Otherwise, when we act like everybody else, when we act like people who have not been changed by the gospel, we're acting like we're ashamed of the gospel. We're acting like we're ashamed of Jesus when we act like everybody else instead of acting like 
we have been changed by the gospel. Like the gospel has had an impact on us. And so we have to remember that exercising our faith and speaking our faith honors the Lord. Exercising and, and speaking our faith honors the Lord. And honoring the Lord grows our faith. When we bring honor to the Lord, our faith increases. Our faith is grown when we exercise and we speak our faith. And we need to be, be, be so secure in our faith in the Lord that no matter what comes our way in this life, our faith isn't going to be dragged away from us. That no matter what somebody else says, our faith isn't going to be ripped out of our hands. We do this in other parts of our lives, but when it comes to spirituality, it's not necessarily the case. Who in the room uh, likes to watch sports or has a favorite sports team in some area? Well, me too. I have some favorites. Uh, I grew up a Dallas Cowboy fan, still am. We moved to Houston. You know, I, grew up in da- I lived in Dallas until I was about nine. Uh, it's a Dallas Cowboy fan. Moved to Houston the year the Houston Oilers left. So there wasn't a Houston football team. So the Oilers were my team. Or not the Oilers, no. We, 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 bleh, now that the Titans, we don't like them anymore. No, the Cowboys are my team. I got Cowboy hats. Grown up, had, had some Cowboy jerseys. Uh, Troy Aikman was the man. And then there was the, the, the wilderness that we're still walking through as Cowboy fans. Um, but I, I also grew up loving the uh, Houston Astros. Uh, went, moved to Houston again when I was nine. Went to the Astrodome. Watched games after games, and they went to, built the other field and went there, and uh, Minute Maid Park, the juice box, watched games there. It's a great, great fun, um, just because they're my team. Cowboys, Astro, love them. I'll wear them. I'll tell people I like them. Even when things don't go like I want them to go when it comes to your favorite teams, as a Cowboy fan, that always comes December, January. Uh, as an Astro fan, a few years ago, there was an issue when they made decisions I wasn't a fan of, but that didn't mean I stopped being a fan, just because things don't go the way I want, just because things don't happen the way I want, just because the coach doesn't call me on Saturday and ask how he should play, on, or how he should tell his team on Sunday, I wish he would, then things would be good and right, <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, too. They would not. Absolutely. I would ruin both those teams. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, not that the Cowboys can get, you know, struggle any more than they do. But we keep getting promises of the Super Bowl someday. Someday, someday, the Super Bowl will come and happen. You know, happen someday, whatever. But uh, that doesn't mean I don't like those teams anymore. I'm still going to be loyal. I'm still going to like them. I'm still going to watch them. I'm still going to. Uh, I'm still going to wear my Astros hat. I'm still going to. I got one for my birthday. They got a new hat, a, a new uh, logo. Uh, it's really cool. And so I got one. I got a, a new shirt, a new Astros shirt. I like the Astros. I like the Cowboys. I'm still going to rep them because I'm faithful to the team, no matter what happens. But when it comes to Jesus, we don't often act that way. We'll sometimes say, we'll come to church and we'll whisper it and we'll say it, I'm loyal to Jesus, but when it comes to Monday, when it comes to Saturday, we're not. And we struggle with that. But what the author of Hebrews is saying is he's saying, step it up, like grow your faith. Don't let it just flounder around. Don't let it just, just, just die on the vine. You need to feed it. You need to stretch it. You need to exercise it. Uh, you, 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 you need to speak it so it can grow and thrive. And so these names that are listed here will include ours. Not because we, we want it to, but because we're faithful. Because you want to know the truth, the Lord is faithful to you. No matter what you do. No matter how you act. No matter how you think, he's not going to walk away from you. You could stumble and fall all the way to rock bottom and then dig a little deeper because you want to go further down than that. But he's not going to leave you. He's going to be in the hole with you, helping you get out because he's faithful. He's faithful and will never stop being faithful because it's in his nature. It's in his character. And when the gospel comes into us and changes us, we should then begin to adapt our nature to his. Or as Paul says in Romans 12, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. 
ourselves. And our minds are only renewed when they're renewed day by day by allowing Scripture to guide us and change us and God's Word to, to, to take us from where we are and move us into where He wants us to be. He loves us so much that He will meet us wherever we are. But He also loves us so much that He won't leave us there. He wants to help us grow in our faith. And that, then when we're faithful and growing in our faith, that brings honor to the Lord. That brings praise to the Lord. And so if you did a, a self-assessment, does your faith honor the Lord? The faith you currently have right now. And we all have aspirational faith, faith we want to have. Like if we were given a quiz and we went one through ten, where's your faith? We would you know, inevitably do aspirational numbers and not what is the truth and what is actuality. But if you were transparently to say to Jesus, this is where my faith is. Don't say it out loud. Where is your faith really? Does your faith honor the Lord? Are you regularly stretching and exercising and speaking your faith? Is it a regular practice? that you live out? Is there somebody, a name the Lord has already spoken to you this morning that you need to speak your faith to? And when I pray in a minute, call the invitation, and people are going to come and people are going to pray, maybe you need to slip out and make a phone call to somebody because maybe the Lord already told you this week you need to share the gospel with that person and you didn't. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's your parent, sibling, cousin. Are you regularly stretching, exercising, and speaking your faith? Do you need faith today? Maybe you need faith for the first time, believing that Jesus is God's son, that he died, so all your sins, all of them, even the ones you haven't told the person sitting next to you about yet, that he died so all your sins would be forgiven, and then he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. Maybe you need to believe in that today for the first time. And become a follower of Jesus, become a Christian, become saved from eternal punishment and embrace eternal, eternal life. It can begin today if you'll believe and have faith. Maybe you need to be like that father who came to Jesus and said, I have faith, help me where I lack faith. I believe, help me in my unbelief. And you need to say, Jesus, I have faith in certain areas of my life, but there's others that I'm holding on to. That, 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 that I'm not letting go because I want to control this area of my life and not give it over to you and not give it to you in faith and let you have and let you handle and let you do what you do. And maybe today what Jesus wants you to do is let go. Just, just let go. Relinquish control and allow him to take it. I mean, it's what uh, Charles Stanley has always said, great preacher out of Atlanta, Obey the Lord and leave all the consequences to him. God will take care of the rest. You just follow what God's put before you. Allow him to do it because he's in control. He's really in control. We act like we're in control, but we're not. He's the one in control. God is in control. God has a plan and God's plan is good. Will you follow his plan for you today in faith and grow your faith to the level he has designed it to be at? Because your faith wants to grow. It wants to grow. It was designed to grow. Will you give it the right ingredients to grow today? Y'all pray with me. God, I pray for all of our faith. All of the faith that we have Across this room, the people watching online, where there may be seasons of our life where we feel like we demonstrated great faith, or certain areas of our life where we feel it's not that hard to be faithful there. But God, I'm praying right now for the areas in our lives that we're struggling in our faith. We're struggling to give you control. We're clinging to ourselves our own rationale, our own thinking, and not allowing you to have your way. We've been distracted by the enemy into building a bridge that never should have even been contemplated. God, help us. Help us all 
to grow in our faith, to stretch our faith, to exercise our faith, to speak our faith so that honor can be brought to you in our faith grown. God, give us all the a vision for what one year from now would look like if every person in this room had their faith grown exponentially. How would that have changed a queen? Southwest Arkansas. In your name, if our faith grows together towards you. God, help us. Help us. God, we're here. We're, we're sitting in these pews. We're, we're spiritually kneeling in our hearts before you. Help our faith to grow, to stretch, to expand. So that we can step forward into whatever you call us to. Bringing along as many people as we possibly can to heaven. God, I thank you for today. Thank you for your word that are written on this page for us so many years later to help our faith grow. God, I thank you. In your name I pray. Amen.